Hello. Sorry, I didn't mean that to be quite as ambush-like as it came out. I was hoping more for a benevolent call and response situation. Um, but anyways, thank you all for coming and courageously braving the strange uh, fall New York rains to come out and see the wonderful Jenny Erpenbeck. Um, my name's Ken Chen. I am a writer and uh, associate director of creative writing in the English department. Um, how many of you, is this your first time coming to a Barnard event? Uh, yes, welcome. And how many of you have come here a million times or are possibly a student? So pretty evenly sp split, students slightly outnumbered. Okay, so we have a great event. Um, before we start, I want to thank Sarah Hilgis for um, doing all the intellectual labor um, so I can simply show up and make bad jokes. Um, Lilibeth Bredersen for designing the flyer that is so beautiful. Uh, EMS, uh, Veronica and Word of Bookstore, please buy a book outside, 20% off with a student ID. <laughs> and Mike and the New Directions team. All right. So Kairos by Jenny Erpenbeck and translated by Michael Hoffman is a peculiar love story, and that is a, it is a love story about politics. The story begins when Katerina receives the archival remains of the much older man she had an affair with when she was 19. The novel opens, unusually for a novelist better known for death and ruthless disquisitions into historical trauma, with two people falling in love in the lightest, most deepest romance. I joke to my students that Kairos is the novel in the Jenny Urban Book oeuvre that is perhaps closest to Sally Rooney. But <laughs> as the novel continues, the relationship between Katerina and Hans becomes to seem like an allegory for the dreams and also the limitations of the East German socialist project. Their infatuation seems to imply some new form of allegory, the hope of utopian communism, the anti-fascist transnationalism of the Internationale, and also the sense of control and discipline by which one lover can exert power over another. The paradigmatic Marxist literary form was always the social realist novel, a narrative that provided a structural view of society in all its classes. I once told my friend Aziz that I wept when I saw Jean Renoir's film, The Rules of the Game. And he looked at me, being a political scientist, very confused and said, that just looks like someone filmed the Communist Manifesto. Kairos inverts this genre in a process that might be called psychological materialism. In Kairos, we know how the characters have sex and what they do for a living. We know their deepest cultural touchstones, favorite songs, favorite composers, and how much all their commodities cost. We know their self-fashioning as creative, intellectual, political humans, and we also know the structural forces that actually invented them. Their affair is set in the period before the fall of the Berlin Wall, and like the filmmaker Christian Petzold, Jeremy Erpenbeck is somewhat skeptical that the fall of the Berlin Wall was an unalloyed success. East Germany was the home of the largest police force per capita, as seen, obviously, in the Stasi, but it was also the site of great egalitarianism. 90% of the women were employed, more than anywhere else in the world, and more women were in elected office than in America today. What do we make of this history? There's also a third character in the novel, and like in many of Jenny's books, it is a place. It is East Berlin. And just as the romance between Katerina and Hans what also evaporates are the lost possibilities of East German socialism. Let's give a hand to Jen. Um, I think I stay he here for a short reading and then we talk a bit, then I read a bit, then we talk a bit and so on. <laughs> Um, I, I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time in the Barnard, too. And I'm quite impressed. I saw all the directors, the female directors in the gallery. 
I've never seen that before. Um, yeah, and I who? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I thought I, sh I should read from the beginning first. Oh, hold on. Also, the book has a prologue. Then it has a so-called cardboard box one. And then it has some text in between. And then it has a cardboard box two. And then it has an epilogue. So it's very classical. Um, so I, 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 I think I, I should read the prologue because it's important to, to like know the setting and then I read a bit of the beginning so that you get an impression of East Berlin in the 80s and also perhaps of the beginning of the love story and then we see. Um, will you come to my funeral? She looks down at her coffee cup in front of her and says nothing. Will you come to my funeral, he says again. Why funeral, you are alive, she says. He asks her a third time, will you come to my funeral? Sure, she says, I'll come to your funeral. I've got a plot with a birch tree next to it. Nice for you, she says. Four months later, she's in Pittsburgh when she gets news of his death. It's her birthday, but before she gets any congratulatory calls from Europe, she gets her son Ludwig on the phone saying, Dad died today, on her birthday. The day of his funeral, she is still in Pittsburgh. At five in the morning, 10 o'clock in Berlin, she gets up in time for the beginning of the ceremony, sets a candle on the hotel tabletop, lights it, and plays music for him from YouTube. The second movement of Mozart's D minor piano concerto, the area from Bach's Goldberg variations, the A minor Chopin mazurka. Each piece comes with commercial interruptions. The new Hyundai, a bank offering home loans, a cold cure. When she returns to Berlin six weeks later, she sees the fresh sand pile next to the birch tree. The roses she got a friend to lay on the grave have already been cleared away. Her friend tells her all about the ceremony and the music that was played. What music was it? Mozart, Bach and Chopin, her friend says. She nods. Six months later, her husband is home by himself when a woman turns up and delivers two large cardboard boxes. She was crying, he says. I had to give her a handkerchief. The cardboard boxes are left standing around in Katharina's study into the fall. Each time the cleaning lady comes, Katharina moves them onto the sofa, and once the room's been cleaned, she puts them back on the floor. When she needs to use the library steps, she pushes them aside. She has no space on her shelves for two large cardboard boxes. The basement flooded recently. Maybe she should just take them to the dump. She opens one of them and looks inside, shuts it again. Kairos, the god of fortunate moments, is supposed to have a lock of hair on his forehead which is the only way of grasping hold of him. Because once the god has slipped past on his winched feet, the back of his head is sleek and hairless, nowhere to grab hold of. Was it a fortunate moment then, when she, just 19, first met Hans? One day in early November, she sits down on the floor and prepares herself to sift, sheet by sheet, folder by folder, through the contents of the first box, then the second. It's so much detritus, it's so much detritus, it's a strange word. Uh, I really, I practice it, but uh, still. <laughs> um, mm. It's a good translation, you see. The oldest items date back to 86, the latest are from 92. There are letters and carbons of letters, scribbled notes, shopping lists, desk diaries, photo prints and negatives, postcards, 
collars, a few newspaper clippings, a sugar cube from the Café Kranzler disintegrates in her fingers. Pressed flower petals slip out from between pages. Passport photographs stay pinned to pieces of paper. There's a twist of hair in a matchbox. She has a suitcase of her own, full of letters, carbons, and souvenirs, flat product for the most part, as the archivists like to say, her own diaries and journals. The next day, she climbs up the library steps and takes it down from the top shelf. It's incredibly dusty inside and out. A long time ago, the papers in his boxes and those in her suitcase were speaking to each other. Now they are both speaking to time. A suitcase like that, cardboard boxes like that, full of middles and endings and beginnings, buried under decades worth of dust. Pages that were written to deceive alongside other pages that were striving for truth. Things itemized, other things passed over, all lying together higgledy-piggledy. The contradictions and the denials, silent fury and mute adoration together in one envelope, in one folder. What is forgotten? just as creased and yellowed, yellowed as what dimly or distinctly one still remembers. While her hands pick up dust from the old folders, Katerina remembers how her father used to make guest appearances at childhood birthdays as a magician. He would throw a whole pack of playing cards up in the air and still manage to pick out the one that she or one of the other children had chosen. <clears throat> so now the real beginning. On that Friday, Friday in July, she thought, even if he comes now, I'm still going. On that Friday in July, he spent all day over two sentences. Who knew writing was this hard, he thought. She thought, I've had it up to here with him. He thought, and it's not getting any better. She, maybe the record will have come. He, the Hungarians will maybe have a copy of the Lukács. She grabbed her jacket and bag and went out. He picked up his jacket and his cigarettes. She crossed the bridge. He walked up Friedrichstraße. And because there was no sign of the bus coming, she dove into the second-hand bookstore. He passed Französische Straße. She bought a book, and the price of the book was 12 marks. And when the bus stopped, he got in. She had the exact change. And just as the bus had closed its doors, she emerged from the store. And when she saw the bus not yet moving off, she broke into a run. And the bus driver made an exception for her and opened the reward door. And she got on the bus. As they passed the open cafe, the skies grew dark. And when they reached the Kronzprinzenpalais, the storm broke. A flurry of rain blew at the passengers when the bus stopped on Marx Engels Platz and opened its doors. A lot of passengers pressed in to get out of the rain. And she, who had been by the door, was pushed into the middle. The doors closed again, the bus moved off, and she felt for a handhold. And that's when she saw him, and he saw her. Outside, there was now a veritable downpour. Inside, steam was rising from the wet clothes of the passengers who had just got on. The next stop was at the Alex. The stop itself was under the S-Bahn overpass. After getting out, she remained standing under the overpass to wait for it to stop raining. And the other passengers who had got off, they too remained standing under the overpass, waiting for it to stop raining. He too had got off and was standing there. And she looked at him a second time. And he looked at her. And because the air was colder now after the rain, she pulled on her jacket. She saw him smile and smiled herself. 
And then she understood that, he, that she had pulled on her jacket over her handbag. She felt stupid because now she understood that that was why he had smiled. She straightened herself out and waited some more. At last, the rain stopped. Before she stepped out from under the overpass, she looked at him a third time. He responded to her look and set off in the same dire direction. After not many steps, he caught her heel between two paving stones and he slowed his step. She was able to free herself and walk on and he picked her tempo right away, picked up her tempo right away. Now they were both walking and smiling at the ground. They walked down a flight of steps through the long tunnel and up onto the other side of the road. The Hungarian Cultural Center closed at six and it was five past. She turned to him saying, it's shut already. And he replied, shall we have a coffee? And she said, yes. That was all. Everything was underway. There was no other possibility. It was July 11th, 1986. How could he shake her off this kid? What if someone saw her, them together? How old was she anyway? I'll have my coffee black without sugar. That way he'll take me seriously. Some chit-chat and go, he thinks. What's her name? Katharina and his Hans. <laughs> yeah. That was the beginning. Thank you so much. Let's give Jenny another. Can you hear us? Okay, great. Hello, hello. Very good. good. You're being recorded. Ach so. <laughs> <laughs> the Stasi is everywhere. <laughs> I, I wanted to talk about uh, the genesis of this book and how you started thinking about Katerina and Hans, but more generally, how you create characters. Um, so as I said, I was very surprised because I first discovered your work through Visitation, which I loved, and then End of Days. And I feel like as your work has gone on, it's become more novelistic. Uh, and those two books are brutal in certain ways. And then I was surprised to discover the joyfulness of, not the whole book, but the beginning <laughs> of this book. Um, so one question I had was, um, how did you arrive at Katerina and Hans? Um, did you start with them? Did you... In those other two books, I felt like you were almost using historical materialism as a form of characterization, doing different historical periods and coming from the outside. Um, but was that the case here? Um, did you start with their specificity? What, what made you first think of Katerina and Hans? Um, yeah, actually the beginning was... Uh a, a different one. I, I thought it should be possible to uh, make up a museum in, uh, in the form of a book. So um, I thought I should like have an exhibition in my book uh, of all the things that I remember from my youth and uh, all the like daily routines in East Germany, which is a country that disappeared. <laughs> And um, just to go back in time. Um, and the reason for, for doing so was that um, whenever, there, there are also some chapters about East Germany in my other books, but it's, they are only short passages. Um, and whenever I was asked about it, uh, this uh, subject, I, I, I felt really uncomfortable and I thought there is something hidden in in me myself, so uh, like a dark corner in which I didn't like to to look. And after thirty years, uh, I thought I'm grown up enough now to 
to have a look at this dark corner. Um, so there was no love story in the beginning. But without love story, it didn't work. <laughs> no, it, it was like... Um, I think the beginning was I, I wanted to skip the like the private aspects of it, but but of course this is a stupid idea for a book. And then I thought um, it's interesting to have these uh, uh, two characters who are so different in age, so that um, I could not just tell uh, or speak about the time in which I was young in, in East Berlin. Um, but also about the beginning of uh, of East Germany, which, in my opinion, um, should be seen like in the fascist time already, because many many uh, people who were became the founders of GDR um, were either in the emigration or in the prisons of the Nazis or some of the very enthusiastic communists after the war had been very enthusiastic uh, Nazi youngsters during the fascist... No, nah, not uh, collaborators. Uh, no, young, not just people. being brought up in the Nazi time as like, uh, what is it, uh, like... Uh, in, in German, I know the word. <laughs> but the no, like, like very enthusiastic little Nazis, like Hans. And and so I think it, it's always to 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 um, um, it's it's a mistake to look at GDR as like our zero in 1945, and then everything is starting, and the founding is in 1949, um, because you should think about the situation in which this country was founded. And uh, the encounter of these two generations uh, made it possible for me to to tell the early history as well as the late history and all the mistakes that were made on the way. Because when I was born, everything was already, I would say, in a way, over. The, the most uh, difficult moments in East German history had uh, taken place already without me being alive. So I think uh, you should just see the whole, and it's, it's interesting to have these, this encounter and this dialogue between the generations. So you knew you needed these two characters so you could cover the different eras of history. Um, there, one thing I love is that in the book, the characters are often quoting you know, Lenin or Brecht, um, as well as poetry, poets like Holderlin and so forth. And you have this quote from Lenin um, that almost hints at Lenin as the novelist, where he says, in order to truly know a subject, it is necessary to comprehend and study all of its aspects, all its relationships and instrumentalities, which seems a little bit like your method of characterization. But how did you end up on the love affair part? It seemed like there, you have almost uh, annoyance with yourself that you, it ended up on some private lives of characters. What, what was that process like? Naya, as, as one, one can easily see when reading the book, is that there is like uh, a shifting of, of power throughout the, the, whole, the whole book. So it's like um, there are different phases in the book and also the, the, the big process of something being glorious in the beginning and then uh, the slow growing of some like uh, bad aspects so that in the end um, change the whole thing into something that is really hard to to stand and to 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 keep uh, interested me and I thought there are certain structures in the relationship in the private private relationship between Hans and Katharina that resemble the, the political um, uh, processes um, that I experienced in, at the end of the GDR. And this interested me because it's also a question of uh, let free of trust, of true language, 
Um, and this makes it also interesting for, for writing a novel about it because and I think one of the main uh, problems in the GDR was the untrue language in the newspapers. So this, um, all the facades behind which there was nothing real anymore to, to, to grab. And uh, this is also the problem of the relationship between Katharina and Hans, and, and it interested me to tell both and to mix them up. My wife used to actually be involved in international women's rights, and the thing that made her quit was she felt the language had become too debased. So she went to become a writer and an artist. Which Good is decision. <laughs> what do you say? Good decision. <laughs> yeah, no. But I, I feel like what's interesting is that the characters are also using language in the book. So you have um, characters writing in their diaries, and the diary becomes this site where um, when you know someone else is reading your diary, there can be this interesting way where you can't tell what is fiction and what is nonfiction. And um, you also have, overall the novel is in the perspective of third person, but then gradually we have Hans becoming first person because he's writing uh, these cassette tapes and it, we have the testimony of Hans. Um, so what, I know in a lot of your works you're often interweaving found language, detritus language, official language. How did you think about um, the viewpoint and, and how characters would describe and tell their own stories in this book? Now, yeah, um, when I started uh, writing the book, it just happened that uh, there were so uh, all the layers at once in the text. So like what he thinks, what she thinks, what he's ex expecting, what he's um, speaking, what he's telling her, what he's hiding before her. And so she does. So, so there are thoughts, there are things that are um, like uh, sp spoken about. There are things that are remembered in different ways. So there are many uh, layers of truth and of like hiding the truth and just expecting something but not t speaking about it. And, and uh, it, it, it turned out to be a, a, a good and interesting thing to me to, to um, interweave, weave, interweave everything. So to make a mixture of it. And so you will always hear something, and you hear also, as a reader, you hear also the, the voices that are in the background. And uh, then it gets more and more complicated because Hans is someone who's kind of directing the present in order to have a nice past to remember. So even when he's living in the present, he is very aware of how, what they are doing, uh, what um, paths they take through the city or, you know, so because he knows one day he will look back. So uh, actually he's always looking back, even when moving forward in life. And, and of course Katarina is in a different situation. She's young, she's open to the future, she is like curious and um, so in the beginning when, when he offers her to like uh, make a repetition of this first encounter that I just read, um, she, she would think is a nice idea. But it gets more and more like a corset in time in which she, she gets caught. And this, this was interesting to me, that, that the slow process of losing truth and the slow process of losing openness to the future. Um. You were talking about how um, you originally began by thinking that this book would be a museum, and uh, which is interesting because I feel like it's so, uh, it's very archival, and you have the cardboard boxes. Um, but I feel like uh, clearly in your work in general, there is this archival uh, quality to it. And in um, Not a Novel, you write about time that behind everything we can see, hear, and touch, another reality is concealed, a reality that we can't see and can't hear and can't touch, a reality made of time. 
And I feel like the archive does so many things in your work in ways even very different from a lot of artists and writers who deal with archive. But what is your process? Is it, it sounds like you, we were just talking about your uh, next book, which is about a poet that you spent a lot of research on. It seems like there is a research portion that is very labor intensive, but then, and then that's one stage. And then later you also have to imagine out of it and uh, summon the ghosts who become your characters. Um, what, what is that process usually like for you? Maya, um, I really um, came to love archives. Uh, I think they are um, different from one would expect in the beginning. They are places that are very alive and, and uh, like the documents, at least to me, are, are always things which are very uh, like like keeping keeping life life of other times. If you manage to bring them to, back to life, and as a writer, you 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 can try so, to do so. And um, sometimes documents are answering each other unexpectedly. So so for uh, for instance for um, uh, for for visitation, I would found uh, find one list of things that a Jewish family wanted to take with them when they emigrate to Brazil, but then they, they couldn't manage to get out of Germany. And I would find another list in another archive uh, with the same items on the list, but for selling, for being sold by the Nazis. And so there, there were these two lists, uh, like as a like dusty documents, but of course they were very alive and they were talking to each other and you could understand what happened. So, so I really came to, 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 um, to love archives and to love documents. And uh, I always try to include some documents into my novels because I think it's, it's so, if I'm impressed by uh, original voice, also the reader will be impressed by the original voice. And I am, I am you know, I, I'm, I think reality is often much more interesting than something that a writer can invent. And also this is a kind of invention to use the right things, to use the right voices. And um, yeah, for, for Kairos, I had my own diaries. I must confess, and <laughs> not the whole. I, I want to ask you how much is autobiographical. <laughs> how much? Yeah, the question. I usually used to say uh, seventy-two percent <laughs> is autobiographical. Um, Naya, it's it was more. Um, it's it's interesting to look at your, your younger self as a historical uh, character or, or like material. And, and what I did was, um, for the first time, I would look into these early diaries and I would find uh, things like, I really had forgotten, so I, I can only give you the advice to, to have a diary and to not burn the diaries, this is a crime. <laughs> Even if you think they are completely stupid, but there will always be something interesting in it. And perhaps things that you don't expect to be interesting, but other things that are in some far future interesting to someone else. So there's this, this author Kempowski who, who um, would uh, announce that he's collecting diaries of people so to prevent them from burning diaries of relatives, you know, or, or their own diaries. So, so he had, in the end, he had collected 2,000 diaries and he, he built, in his house, he built a tower for the diaries of, of people that he didn't know. Very interesting. Ah, yeah. also I had my di diaries and I, I would open them and look for the first time after 30 years in, into this, like the diaries of the, that time. And I, I would fi find such um, notes like the one about my feeling when the wall just uh, had fallen down. Naya, down, you wouldn't say it was opened. Uh, 
and the Westerners would come to East Berlin, and all of a sudden, um, it smelled like Chanel Number no. Five. <laughs> and <laughs> and then then I was like irritated and like. Perhaps my city will never ever smell as it smelled when it was my city. So, so things that were immaterial, so to say, they, they changed. And um, uh, you immediately understood that something happened that couldn't be taken back again. And, and uh, as I used to say, if something is lost, you are not just missing the th good things that are lost, but also the bad ones that you just knew and you were familiar with, because it's, it, change takes a lot of energy and is always a big thing, even if you lose things that you didn't like. There, there was this uh, article about astronauts going and landing on the moon for the first time and how they described the situation, this most cosmic, existential you know, experience beyond human experiences. And a lot of them would say, stars, wow. And then someone finally said, they should have sent poets into space instead <laughs> of us. But I feel like one thing that's um, lovely and surprising in the book are these moments where Katerina goes to West Berlin and has culture shock of capitalism. And she asks, what, what does freedom actually mean? Um, or there's a part at the end, very ominously, where she says, was I going to become a customer? And I'm curious about um, what has been the reception of your book in Germany or as you've been on tour in America. Reading it, it occurred to me that perhaps, you know, clearly it couldn't have been written 40 years ago, but I feel like it would be banned in America 40 years ago because of there's so much anti-communism here. But what, what has been... Uh, the reaction uh, among Ger whether in in West Germany or East Germany, what what has surprised you? Yeah. Um, also, first the bad news or the good news? <laughs> <laughs> also, first the bad news. Also, the the the, um, the West Germans are not so interested anymore in East Germany. They think we have complained enough now, and we should be silent and. It has been spoken enough about this country that disappeared, and we are so lucky to have the democracy, and that's it. So there are others, of course, um, like they, in a way they, they got lost in the book, they told me. Uh, also many men who really came to hate Hans, did Which they feel implicated? In, infl Im implicated. What Did they think, am I Hans? I don't know. <laughs> I, I was wondering because, you know, also the hatred is a very close relationship. <laughs> so in a way, I was, they, they told me, they would tell me in, in, at once that they were lost in the book for three days and they hated Hans. <laughs> you know, <laughs> something strange about it. Also, these were also Westerners. But in the East, uh, it's different. In the East, many, many readers were kind of relieved that someone wrote about this time in the, in the way I did. And, um, and it's also not about East and West Germany. Sometimes there were also women um, in, the, in the signing queue, <laughs> very strangely, and, and saying, like, how did you know my story? So I... I absolutely lived through the same kind of love story of like, um, it's, it's, a, it's also, I, I would say it's a kind of abuse, even if Katarina is already grown up. And uh, I, there was one reading in which five women, one after the other, came in the signing queue <laughs> and telling me that they have to experienced the same they were thing. Yeah, the which was strange. Um, yeah, and, and in Germany there is a, there is a discussion just now um, going on. Uh, I don't know if you he uh, heard about the book uh, by Dirk Oschmann. He, he actually, he was a, or he is a German studies professor uh, in, I think in Leipzig or, or Chemnitz. I'm not sure. But um, 
he got so angry that he wrote a book called uh, The East is an Invention by the West, <laughs> of the West. So and and he he wrote about all the differences that still exist between Easterners and Westerners. And then there was this book by Katja Hoyer. She she is of East German origin, but she, she has been teaching in uh, some uh, university in in London uh, for years. And she wrote a book in English about uh, like a history of GDR. And there's both books have been on the bestseller list for. Months and months and months. So I think all 17 million East Germans bought the book <laughs> or both books. <laughs> so and the Westerners are really irritated. So like, aha, uh -huh, they are starting to tell their own story. You know, it's it's like getting it back. And 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 there's one sentence in um, in in this book, in which I say uh, the 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 license to tell. The story, the, the history of East Germany has changed the ownership. And now I think it's time, 30 years later, to, to get it back, the ownership of, of telling a story about it. And this is an interesting process. And, and in a way, I, I'm, as a like, fiction author, I'm perhaps part of it. Um, I want to ask you another question about East and West. But before that, I'm curious about all these women who, who said Katerina's life was my life. And Katerina starts the novel in a very different way than she ends it. In the beginning, she's a 19-year-old girl. She is lower in the power relationship. She's very much an ingenue. Um, I don't want to give away the end of the novel, but she's in a very different place at the end. And I don't know, when you were making Katerina, did you feel like she was a type? or was there something specific you were trying to capture in that transition? And I don't know if this is too overdetermined, but do you think Katerina is a feminist? Do you think she is undergoing some kind of process? Or was that change a little bit more about you modeling the decay of the German project? Um, my, um, see, I think as a Perhaps at the end she she has enough material to become a feminist, <laughs> but uh, in the she's she's someone who's really like having her first love, which is a special thing in everyone's life, um, and in a way also she has power even in the beginning. She's a young, relatively beautiful girl, and and you know. Also, he gets obsessed by her. Um, and there were many people asking me, why doesn't she go away? And I think this is the interesting question, because she is, she's kind of destroyed by him. Only in the end, she, na ja, good, we shouldn't tell the end. <laughs> but, spoiler alert. <laughs> OK, no spoiler. But um, the interesting thing, and I, I really do hope that as many young women as possible read the book, <laughs> because I think it's not only happening in East Germany, it's a, an experience that can be made worldwide. Um, the the inter interesting thing is that he, uh, he um, uh, also, this is not spoiling. Also, she she uh, she spends one night with someone else, one single night, and he uh, like uses this kind of Hans. guilt. Hans uh, uses this kind of guilt, so to say, to to um, uh, uses it as an instrument to prolong the relationship. So she has to to, to guilt her. Yeah, and and to to um, also if you put it to the like the very simple thing is like he prolongs having sex with with her by by making her feeling guilty and uh, not letting her getting away. And the interesting thing is that he puts this kind of guilt into herself 
and and so it's not just saying uh, you should um, you should explain everything to me. Why did you do so? You know, he says you can't look into the mirror anymore because you are such a bad girl. <laughs> so he she she is she is destroyed in herself, which is like. Uh, a process she she should be aware of, but she 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 cannot. Um, and I think such uh, such uh, structures are are interesting in relationships. And um, I could only give the advice to just if you suffer too much, you go away. <laughs> so that that's your message to dump him if you are. Is it only, only for the birds? <laughs> no, no, no. But I I thought that that situation is so interesting because in a lot of your work there's this tension of of hope and the romanticism of hope but also at the same time this uh, almost existentialist anti-humanist realization that there is no hope um, there, there's this incredible short essay and not a novel where you talk about um, hope being the glue that brings your family together and I feel like there's this question of why doesn't Katerina leave this guy who's literally you know beating her up uh, and it seems like it is about a perverse kind of hope, uh, hope to be a good person or a hope towards purity. No, I think also hope to, uh, to get back the respect for yourself and the solution is somewhere else and it takes some time to understand this, that the solution is not inside the relationship but outside. Um, so you're so to return to East Germany, uh, you have all these great, um, you, you have all these moments where the characters are using the the history of the the Second World of Lenin Brecht as a kind of intellectual culture, um, where they're opening the fridge and thinking about something Lenin once said, and which I think is so amazing. Uh, first of all, but uh, I was thinking while reading it, a lot of this quote that I, from Trotsky that I've been thinking a lot about ever since Trump was elected here, where he says, communism is the politics of revolutionary hope, and fascism is the emotion of uh, counter-revolutionary despair. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the United States, the, the people who swung for Trump were often people in places where union density had collapsed. So people who were served by the labor movement that had vanished as those jobs went overseas. And uh, clearly we're in this moment of fascist resurgence around the world. And in East Germany, which was the site of the gloriousness of some form of social democracy, you know, the, it is the, the rise of the, the ADP with the, the German right. And what, how do you feel about that? What is your diagnosis? Um, what do you feel about the rise of the right and its relationship with uh, some kind of socialist project? Uh, is there hope for all of us? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> it's all up to you, oh, the young ones. No. Um, also, first, uh, I, I, I should mention that uh, quite a lot of uh, the, the right-wing people uh, who are like organizing the AFD, this right-wing party, um, moved to the East. So that it now seems that the East is more right-wing than the West. But the leading figures are almost all coming from the West. And there's not much of a difference. And I think the, the um, uh, it's also a mistake to um, to look for the reason for um, for f for uh, this right wing movement uh, to look for it only in the history of GDR and not um, and not before the GDR. You know, we all inherited some fascist things in Germany. Every, as a, not only the East, also the West. And it's also, uh, one must, must also see what happened to the East after the wall fell. So whole industries were closed down. Factories sold for one euro or like one apple and an egg, egg as we say in German. 
and then closed down. So literally millions of people lost their jobs and they they really had to do uh, to to deal with a um a tremendous change so like not only losing the jobs but to get used to the new society how do i make a make a living how do i pay these rents which went up so high that one was just panicking and um so there was a there was this big change. It was also the way how the Easterners were um, they were not only open arms in the West. I, I during my readings I met many, many Easterners in the West telling me I'm from the East, but I never told my colleagues. You know, it was like second class Germans. And of course it um it does something with the people when they are confronted being second-class people all the time. And the expectations were completely different. So when they, when they uh, voted for becoming West Germans and like for the unification, they thought we will be Westerners in the next minute. But then it turned out it's a long process. It's, it's uh, many things were really hard to stand. And, um, even now, this is the the, the book by Oshman is is uh, also speaking about uh, the uh, the fine different uh, finances of the Westerners and the Easterners. So he says in some in some uh, professions, uh, the difference in being paid for the same work is forty percent. And also our money, like the East German money, was um, uh, the, the money that we had on our accounts was made half with the fall of the wall. We only could, were allowed to keep 4,000 marks and the rest was made half of it. So then many, many houses were given back to the West German owners who fled. Uh, from East Germany in the 50s or 60s. And now, then, also after the fall of the wall, there was a law saying uh, all the real estate should be given back to the people who, who fled to the West. So many, many, many people made this experience of like um, being deprived of things that were essential to their lives. And so they had a big distrust against the gov West German gov government. They, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't identify with the West German government. And I think this is also uh, an important aspect of like becoming right-wing um, as a form of opposition against the so-called elite which I think is also here the problem, that some people are, feel like the forgotten ones. And they, they, it's, uh, when, I, like when I look at the, the fees for a study here, uh, I cannot believe, you know. And it's hard to, to make this way to a university. And when I look around, I hardly see any black person here. I don't know if I'm allowed to say black. But um, you know what I mean. And I, I want to clarify, I wasn't saying that the, the right wing population of East Germany came from the Stasi, but the reverse, that the East Germans were anti-fascist and there was a social democratic state. And it was that evacuation which creates this kind of resentment. Naya, also in, in East Germany, I, I was really, uh, it, it, it's, uh, until now, I, I, I have no real explanation, but I was taught in school the international, uh, like, what was it, proletarian, proletarian internationalism. So we were taught solidarity and like everyone is equal and whatever kind of, of skin he or she has, you know, and, and whatever wherever he, he or she comes from. So, so this was what we were taught in school and I was, I was really shocked even at the end of the GDR when there were some neo-Nazis 
I think it was also a way of uh, pro pro provocation because um, if you if you would paint a swastika on the wall, it was like uh, you know like being the bad one, and sometimes young people want to. Be the wet one, yeah, rebellions in a, in a stupid way. Um, so we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, but I can also vamp and improvise if you are shy human beings. Um, one thing I was wondering about is I feel like a big texture of the book is also, uh, and this might be something that is actually secretly very personal, is uh, all the art that the people... Hans and Katerina consume. And there's a way where the book is a Bildungsroman where Katerina is being molded in to like Bach and to like the well-tempered clavier and to like Mozart. And they see movies and they go to the theater. Um, did you, I feel like that was so um, present. And, and also about art as the medium through which we explore our relationship with other people or through we fall in love or through which we have aspirations to connect or be like someone. Um, what was that? Mm -hmm. Can you talk more about that? Now, yeah, I think it was uh, much more um, a way of uh, communication within the society than it is now. Now it's like a bit like uh, consuming art or like being entertained or spend a nice evening. Uh, of course, also. Uh, be in some nice uh, go, uh, company with people who are interested in the same things. But in GDR, it was an essential way of speaking to each other uh, in, like, indirectly, the detour made by art, <laughs> so, so to say. So we would wait desperately for a new performance in the theater, or we would desperately wait for a book to be published or there were queues in front of the bookstores where people waiting for the book you know it, it really had was was meaningful to us to to have these things and um, of course we didn't have all books that are sold in the west but we had quite a lot and they were cheap it was also in the in the interest of the like government to to keep the people well educated, so to say, and we, we could see Tarkovsky movies in the cinema or things like that. We, we, we had own filmmakers that were very good, um, also very good directors in the theater, authors that were interesting. And it was also like um, learning to, uh, to, to read what was behind the words. So we 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 uh, got used to it also by the reading the newspaper <laughs> in a, in a different way <laughs> to understand what was not spoken about in the newspaper, and in the theater performance we would see uh, Goethe or Grabe or whatever kind of play from the like 200 years ago, 300 years ago, and we would make sense of it for for our society, and this was the fun of it. So it was of great importance to, to us, not just like spending a nice evening. Questions from the audience? We have extraterrestrial visitors. <laughs> yes, right here. Just thinking of what you were just kind of discussing about culture in the DDR. It reminds me of, Kairos reminds me so much of Christa Wolf's work, particularly, um, I read it in German, but Der Geteilte Himmel, or The Split Heaven, where using a kind of socialist, kind of political narrative through the guise of a romance and navigating kind of people as archetypes versus people as sort of specific individuals and the way that connects to the politics. And I was curious also because of what you brought up earlier about this novel in comparison to Visitation and End of Days and these other novels where I feel like characters seem more like archetypes in those books rather than here, which is interesting considering that what I feel like seems like an influence. And I was curious if while writing this, how you were navigating sort of the romance novel 
even though I know it's kind of hard to call it a romance novel, but a love story, which is so kind of commercial in many ways, or kind of the ultimate popular fiction as a guise to sort of figure out the groundings for the politics of the DDR, its history, its future, or kind of erasure of the future through specific people, specific experiences, rather than sort of the archetypes of your prior work, which were similarly political. Maya, <laughs> it's always difficult to say if one is an archetype or, or just a person. <laughs> um, I would say the interesting thing is that history only um, is made visible in concrete uh, characters. So there is no history without human beings. So it's also a mix. Also, also, it's everywhere a mixture of of like being some historic subject and being a, a, a character. And um, and I would say, uh, of course, I, I read many books about uh, uh, about this time. Also written by writers of my generation, Ingo Schulze, for instance, wrote a very good book about it, and uh, it's called New Lives. And there are some some more writing about this time. And I think um, if each one of us uh, takes one or two or three characters in his or her books, all together, the history becomes visible. So it's like. Um, I, uh, you know, sometimes I invent things, sometimes I, I uh, take real material, and it's always a mixture, so, so I don't know. I'm not a German studies uh, person, you know, <laughs> and I'm happy about it, <laughs> I must confess. And, and uh, so, so the border shouldn't be made by me by myself, you know. It's just uh, like, uh, the interesting thing is that everybody can be an archetype. There are so many stories to tell to understand what happens in history and what change means and how the transition is made. Uh, so, and the transition is made in everyone's biography. So, so one, once it's just recently, I had a student from uh, Hoyerswerda, which is one of the like um, not so well. I uh, liked uh, uh, smaller cities in former East Germany with, with not so good reputation because also some some bad things happened against refugees and the, the people wanted to burn down a house and I don't know what. And and she she was afraid to write about her own world and I I would say you know she, she this is interesting and this is much more like if you put it like this, exotic than if you travel to Africa. Because this is what nobody know, knows, how, how, how does such a place uh, um, be, become a place in which aggressivity is, is like this, that, that people s uh, scream for like burning down a house in which there are refugees. You know, if you look at the, at the single... Um, Characters that you know, it's interesting enough. There's not, you don't need any more. Other questions? I feel like partly you're saying that because we're all produced by historical structural forces, we're each a little bit more like an archetype than we might think. Yeah, it's, it's um, I think no one's life is boring, and every life is formed by historic circumstances. And, and of course, uh, we are lucky if our life is a bit boring. And if nothing happens, you can say, I'm happy. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's wrong. <laughs> no, but of course. Uh, Where do you live now? Where, what? Where do you live now? No. In Berlin. Very boring. East or German? <laughs> East or Western West Berlin? This is a question. East Berlin, right at the border. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
I, 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 it's funny because I, I wrote about, in, in, in my essays, in one of my essays, I, I wrote about being brought up and uh, grew up always right at the border in East Berlin. Of course, there are neighborhoods that are a bit more far away from the border, but I was always at the border. It was always a dead end in my childhood, which was not so bad because it was very quiet, peaceful, no criminals, you know, it was no traffic through the neighborhood because it ended at the war. So, and I'm, I'm still, somehow I ended up at, in an apartment uh, at Bernauer Straße, also not far from Bernauer Straße where the border was. And the famous, perhaps you, some of you know, the Mauer Park, the, the park that was made in the place where the border was. Long park clearly, and uh, I'm not far from this uh, park, and I, when I go by bike somewhere, I always pass the mem memorial site of the wall and think about it. One last question here. Um, I really love the book, and one, some of my favorite things were how private both Hans and Katarina were able to keep the relationship sort of by choice and then sometimes like in the scenes where Katarina saw Hans and his family at the beach, it felt like she had this moment of agency where she could break the privacy seal. If we're treating them as allegory or as archetypes, what are we supposed to think of them keeping their lives so separate and then Sometimes she would reveal to her dad that, you know, she was dating a guy 30 years older. Like, what do these snippets of breaking the privacy mean? Or what should we think of them as readers? Or, yeah, we'd just love to hear more. Did you understand the question? Not, not quite. I, I, she, she was saying that she mm. very much enjoyed the moment where Katerina goes to the beach. Mm. And there's this moment where she breaks the privacy and sees Hans with his family. Ah, so, hmm. And she was wondering, there's a way where the two characters, Hans and Katarina, are allegorical figures. Hmm. And she was very curious about the element of privacy, where they're generally private, but then there are moments where they break the privacy. Hmm. And are we supposed to read something allegorically out of that? Or is that, does that have a broader meaning beyond their relationship? Now, yeah, it, the, the, the question of inside and outside is very interesting in the book. So it's also a question of sex, of course, but uh, um, I'm joking. Also, <laughs> no, they were just. Also, sorry, <laughs> sorry. No, but 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 um, uh, to to look at this family as a visitor is a very mean thing to do, I think, and it, it, in a way it hurts. Uh, and and perhaps this is the. Yeah, the interesting thing about it. And, and uh, when there, there's also a moment when Katharina leaves, uh, uh, not leaves East Berlin, but she's allowed to visit her grandmother in the West. And um, she enters the train in, in the station Friedrichstraße, which uh, at this time had been uh, divided in two parts, the, the West German and East German. Part. So she goes to the West German part of Friedrich, Bahnhof Friedrichstraße and then she, she, she um, boards, boards the train. Boards. She boards the train and she starts to go first to, to like by train to West Berlin and then further on to, to West Germany. And because she's living not far from Friedrichstraße, she sees um, the houses that, she, they, that are familiar to her from the backside for the first time in her life because she's passing like the houses of the streets in her neighborhood where she grew up. And, and this is also an experience similar to this scene at the beach. So like pay, pay a look from outside at your own world. So like, uh, like people who uh, had been almost dead later on tell that they saw themselves lying on, on, on the bed, almost dead. And they were like above <laughs> already and looking at themselves. And I think this is an interesting experience to, to have this distance all of a sudden 
to to um, to be an outsider, but still involved in the life, and and both aspects at once. And and this is this is uh, throughout the ho the whole book. It's, it's 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 a question: who's inside, who's outside, who who is allowed to be part of of real life, like Katerina as the like so to say only being the lover, the love affair, she's never allowed to be really there. So, so when she visits Hans in his uh, apartment, there's always uh, the taking back of everything, like, like, um, also making the traces disappear again. So as if life could be taken back or things that she 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 uh like she was drawing she was sitting here she was like cooking with him or whatever and then everything is taken back and and, and in my first life i i was um an opera director and i i i thought it was always interesting when uh on stage things are prepared for the next performance so all the things that happened were taken back and it renewed in a way as if nothing had happened. And this is also some uncanny thing if you live, but you are not allowed to leave traces behind. You know, it's interesting. And this also has to do with the inside and outside. Uh, on this issue of not leaving traces at all. I'm sorry, I haven't read the book, but are, are you interested in making parallels between the story as you've described it and what we, or what I in the West think I know about living in a country where apparently everybody is reporting on everybody else? Uh, so the issue of, is it even possible to have secrets? Is, is that Good an question. interesting subject for you? And, yeah. um, read my book. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's, it's, uh, I, I thought a lot about the Stasi and why it was playing such an important role in, in the GDR. And I, I also see it as a very strange attempt of the government to, to get closer to its inhabitants in a way, to, to, to the people who are living in the country. The, the Stasi as a form of intimacy. Yeah, a very strange form of intimacy to like involve as much people as possible because the files couldn't be read because there were so many. And I think, I, I really doubt that they could make sense of all the files. They just kept it. And they made people, uh, they, they, made, they turned people into loyal people because they involved them in the Stasi, and and uh, this is this is a very strange uh, thing to do, and of course, uh, it, uh, it, um, I I know many people who said my diary was written by the Stasi, you know, it's also strange, so that officials are writing a diary, but but nowadays, you know, we are carrying the mobile phones with us, and sometimes, for instance, that there was a story. Also, I, I took my, my niece in my car, and there was a children's uh, a CD that I put on in, in, the, in the car CD player. And afterwards, next day, I got an advertisement for the CD, you know? And then I thought, hmm, strange. <laughs> Only the mobile phone was, le it was just switched on in my, just in my car, in my bag, or wherever, and, and they, Somehow, Big Brother was spying on me. <laughs> hmm. And this is out of free will, of our free will now. So, yeah. Well, on that optimistic note, um, <laughs> let's give a hand to Jenny. I just wanted to remind people that books are for sale right around the corner. So if you buy one, you can have her sign it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.